Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm always um, a bit wary um, speaking after lunch because everyone's feeling a little bit post prandial. I'm pleased that there's lots of cups of coffee around, um, so hopefully the caffeine will keep you going. Um, Chris um, asked me um, to speak today about um, how we can use um, research to um, address stillbirth. And that's really something that um, has been the focus of my career um, for the last eight years. So I am an obstetrician. I spend half my time um, doing research. I spend half my time caring for patients. So I'm not sitting in an ivory tower dreaming up crazy stuff for you guys to implement. Um, I'm on the front line implementing it as well. Um, so... I guess the first thing, I realise this morning you've had some statistics, but I don't think you can hear numbers too much, that stillbirth in high income countries, we know that, that only, that's 2% of the stillbirths that happen in the world. But over the whole 49 high income countries, the average rate is 3.5 per thousand births. Now, you can add on to that, so that rate for comparison is after 28 weeks of pregnancy. So in countries like ours, you can add 30 to 50% on top of that again, um, because our definition goes down to 24 weeks. Okay? Um, importantly, the number of stillbirths in high-income countries is twice that of the number of neonatal deaths, and about double... Uh, about the same of all the deaths in the first year of life. Now, one of the real challenges that we've had is that the World Health, the, um, the Millennium Development Goals, which are really laudable, were to reduce child death. And the trouble is, stillbirth was not counted in that. So countries around the world have not focused on, on reducing the number of stillbirths. One of the things that's really different between low and middle income countries and high income countries is that 90% of our stillbirths occur before labour starts. In low and middle income countries, 50% of stillbirths occur in labour, okay, compared to 10% in the high income countries. So um, I think, um, Chris, am I right that you've all got a copy of the Lancet Stillbirth series? It's pretty heavy going, okay? They are five papers that are going to take you a lot of time to read. So I'm going to save you um, one of those papers. So the, the, the high-income country paper is the fourth paper in the series. And it had seven key messages. The first is that there's a big variation in stillbirth rate. There's a really important association with disadvantage and marginalisation. We've still got stigma and fatalism in high-income countries. You know, we still encounter people in our professional lives, and I still do, who say this is just one of those things. It's going to happen. You know, and we've got to stand up and say, no, that, this is, that is not an OK thing to think, and it's not justified. We need better measurement. Um, Cheryl has already expanded upon the need for good quality bereavement care. We've got to improve our data quality and think about research. Um, I think behind all of this, what we've got to remember is that stillbirth has a huge cost. It doesn't just affect mothers, um, it affects families, there's increased risk of family breakdown. Women are stigmatised, abandoned and abused for, um, for having a stillborn child. There's big increased healthcare costs. A stillbirth costs 70% more than a live birth. You know, we are in a cash-strapped healthcare system. That is a lever that we can use the powers that, to the powers that be to drive, you know, if we lost fewer babies, there would be fewer costs. There is a big negative effect on staff. You know, we have people going off sick because they're stressed. We have people, you know, caring for parents, bereaved parents, is harder than caring for people that have a nice healthy baby and go home six hours later. And ultimately, the government pick up all of that. So in high-income countries, the lowest rate is Iceland, um, with 1.3 per thousand. The highest rate is Ukraine, 8.8 .8 per thousand. So there's six-fold difference between the best and the worst in high-income countries. <coughs> Excuse me. We ranked about the middle. We were 24th out of 49 high-income countries. Importantly, yes, there's lots of stillbirths 
um, in low and middle income countries. But actually, if we achieved the same rate as the, the best six countries, that's 20,000 stillbirths a year less. And that's a huge impact um, on parents. Um, now, one of the reasons that I really think that we can reduce stillbirth and we can do better is that in the Netherlands, they've gone down at 6.8% per year since the year 2000. Slovenia's gone up. We've only gone down by 1.4% per year. So the Netherlands is getting better at stillbirth at almost four times the rate we are. So here is, where are we? We're in the middle, I've put an arrow there, our big red arrow. There's us, we're in the middle. Um, but you look at the, var the variation. This is the Netherlands here. Poland has gone down, Belarus, Lithuania, um, Denmark. And the interesting thing about, um, particularly about Denmark and the Netherlands is one of the things that they, they've done two things differently to us. The first is they have had consistent high quality audit. And the second thing they've done is they have researched things. You know, if you think about all the randomised control trials there have been in maternity care, the Netherlands have been at the forefront of most of them. Yeah, and participating in a clinical trial improves your outcomes. So, give or take a bit, any of these factors here about disadvantage and marginalisation increase your risk of stillbirth by two. So, we don't really understand why that is, and there's probably lots of different reasons. There's probably dis uh, issues about access to care, about placental complications, um, about a lack of community engagement, about the effects of poverty and economic status, about smoking, um, obesity, um, and, and coexisting illness. It's not simple. So, I guess the first question is, how can research and audit prevent stillbirth? Well, the first research, because if we don't understand why babies are dying, we haven't got any hope of reducing the number of babies that die. It's trying to fix a car without having any understanding of how an engine works. You know, your chances of actually managing to fix the car are pretty small if you don't know why it's broken. Um, we need to then understand the risk factors and then test interventions to reduce stillbirth. Um, and in terms of audit, we need to understand what's associated with stillbirth and also work out where we've, our care has gone wrong. Where have we not managed to do that? But most important of all is this line at the bottom, is that they need to, be, they need to provide a focus to change maternity care. Because we can do as many research projects as we like, and we can do as many audit projects as we like, but if it doesn't actually change the care we deliver to women, it is going to have absolutely no effect on stillbirth whatsoever. And I think that is a, and that is a real challenge for us, because we live, in, we live and we practice in a climate when we are trying to minimise intervention, and we don't want inappropriate intervention. But one of the drivers for increased in things like increasing induction rates is an attempt to reduce the stillbirth rate. And we cannot achieve one without the other. Because if we just say we're just going to carry on delivering exactly the same care that we're delivering now, nothing's going to change. I could be standing here at the end of my career in 20 years' time and we can have the same discussion. So how could it all fit together? Well, if we do research and we understand why babies are dying, we can then think about interventions. We can produce an evidence base. We can then implement some of those changes and we can work out whether it prevents stillbirth. And we can work out whether it prevents stillbirth by perinatal audit. And we can keep going around this loop to try and figure out um, how we can make this better. And that comes down to numbers. Um, those of you who are in practice, how many of you have an active perinatal mortality meeting where you sit down and you discuss all the cases of babies that die in your hospital? Okay, so I reckon that's a third of the room who are here. Yeah, that's essential. You know, that is, that is level one understanding why babies are dying in your unit. Because if you don't do that, how are you going to figure out who's, which babies to make a difference for? 
So measuring and getting that information to the systematic critical analysis, the quality of perinatal care, um, this is what perinatal audit is. And I'm not surprised with that show of hands because actually only 37% of care providers in high income countries said their facility had regular audit meetings. That's got to get more. Because robust perinatal audit, now audit is not sexy, and sitting down of an afternoon to sit down and work out why babies died and were there any deficiencies in care in your unit is not an afternoon that's going to cheer you up a whole load. Um, but it is really necessary and it reduces the number of babies that die by a quarter when it's implemented. I would say that's time well spent. Also, we need to make sure that we're doing all the investigations we can to determine why babies die. And there are three things that are going to really help us. The first is to send, and probably the most important thing, is to send the placenta for histology. And I completely understand that we practice an environment where potentially access to, post, to full post-mortem is a challenging thing. But honestly, people don't care about the placenta. In my view, people really should care about a placenta, but in the main, they don't. That placenta needs to go to a pathologist, and it needs to go to an expert pathologist, not just your local pathologist who sends you back a report that says this is a placenta, because you knew that before you <laughs> sent it to them. Yeah? So it needs to go to someone who's going to tell you useful things. And also chromosome analysis. We need to be sending babies' cords. Um, we thankfully, we no longer need to send babies' tissue. We can send a piece of umbilical cord in some saline, and it will give you a genetic report. And the value depends on a classification system you use. Um, in St Mary's and Manchester, we use the RECO classification system. There's loads of different ones. There's Kodak, which Embrace use. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that you are classifying and understanding what's going on in your unit, because then you can work out year on year what's changing, and that's really important. So the other thing that can be quite challenging is that we need, we've got to face up to the fact that some babies die because of suboptimal maternity care. And that can be anywhere between 30 and 60%. And one thing that Embrace does is they have a confidential review of perinatal death. So I'm sure, so in 2015, they reviewed antepartum, normally formed term stillbirths. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll come on to that in a minute and to think about whether there were any avoidable factors. So were there major avoidable factors where actually if you did something different, then actually the outcome would probably would have been different. And minor things, actually things that we didn't do quite right, but they weren't directly related to the baby dying, or things that we can learn about but didn't make a difference. Now, this is one example of um, how we didn't implement any findings um, from confidential inquiries. So before, I should imagine, most of us in the room started practising there was this confidential inquiry of 422 cases of stillbirth, antepartum stillbirth, in 1996-1997. They were written up in 2001. And the three most common bits of suboptimal care were that we weren't very good at deciding who was low and high risk, that we didn't monitor babies' growth properly, and that we didn't listen to women about their baby's movements, and we didn't act appropriately. Okay, so there's three things that we could have done something about. Okay, in 2013, this was written up in 2015, we looked at 85 cases of stillbirth in 2013, and the things that we found that we didn't do very well, <coughs> well, we weren't very good at monitoring baby's growth, and we weren't very good at educating mums about reduced movements and acting upon reduced fetal movements. There's nearly 20 years between those data sets. And if we don't alter care in what we do, then I could come back in 20 years' time and we can do another confidential inquiry and we can find just the same things. We've got to change what we do. Oh, press the wrong button. Now, one of the ways that we change what we do is we do research. And so one of the things that's important is we ask questions that are important. So we... Um, we led something called the Stillbirth Priority Setting Partnership, 
Um, and it's, it was run with this organisation called the James Lind Alliance. Does anyone know who James Lind was? There's, that is a really serious gold star if anybody knows who James Lind was. <laughs> no? James Lind is the first, the first person in the world credited with doing a randomised controlled trial. And he discovered that vitamin C stops you getting scurvy. And he gave two sailors lemons or limes to rum, who were probably the happiest of them all, <laughs> and, and two of them just like normal ship's biscuits. And he realised that the two guys who had the limes didn't get scurvy. So the whole point of James Linder Lines is that we get trials that are meaningful and matter. And so um, we did this by an online survey. We had um, nearly 1,700 responses, a third of which were parents. Um, and the first thing that was quite interesting is the questions that people, the research questions that people had, actually one in six of them we actually knew the answer to. So whether something was effective or wasn't effective. But we carried on, and then we made 300 in indicative questions. Um, and then there were 48 that were the highest ranked, and then they got ranked by over, nearly uh, over 1,100 uh, participants, and we ended up with 11 research priorities. Now, I won't be testing you on these later, um, but basically, <coughs> things like how, does the how can we look at the structure and function of the placenta better during pregnancy? Does an ultrasound assessment of baby's growth reduce stillbirth? Does modifiable lifestyle factors impinge upon stillbirth? What, what are the best tests to do when a mum comes with reduced movements? Can we, use better, can we get better tests to prevent stillbirth? And why do normally grown babies die? What's the most appropriate bereavement and postnatal care? I mean, it, it, it amazes me, as well as um, what Cheryl was saying, about the fact that lots of things that we, we know are effective don't happen. Actually, there's a huge amount of stuff that we don't know whether it's effective or not. And so, consequently, people like NICE and everybody else, they don't come right in behind us and say, right, you must do this. And that's because we're not generating the evidence to make that happen. Um, uh, Evidence-based information for mums. Um, how do we care for pet mums in subsequent pregnancies? And why is incidence, incidence of stillbirth higher than other high-income countries? So what I want to do now is just to give you just some examples of the research that's happening in the UK to answer some of those questions. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I've got this awful cough that won't go away. Has anyone else got it? It's horrible. Um, so I promise I won't infect you with any horrid adenovirus, but um, it's not very nice. So one of the things that we do in Manchester um, is that we have been doing placental research for about 50 years. And we did the Manchester Advanced Maternal Age Study, and we did that because women over the age of 35 have an increased risk of late stillbirth. And that's particularly true of women over the age of 40. And what we've shown by doing a systematic review is actually, it doesn't matter if you're a multip, it doesn't matter if you're a primip, the age, if you're over 40, you've got an increased risk of stillbirth. And that occurs after 39 weeks of pregnancy. We are not good at predicting that. Now, the interesting thing is if you look, at, you do some boring science, which is actually really quite exciting science, is that if you look at these things called syncytial knots, now syncytial knots are a sign of a placenta getting older, what you can see is mums over the age of 40 have got more syncytial knots than mums over the age of 30. Those placentas are getting older faster. So there's some biology sitting under that. And the, number of the, the proliferation in the placenta goes the other way. So there's placental dysfunction in those women. And what we actually can see is we, by doing more science that you can show that actually these, this is how much amino acid uptake comes in a placenta, that actually women over the age of 40, their placentas are working harder than mums who are under the age of 35. So one of the most important things we've got is that to try and get some underlying biological understanding for what we see in terms of risk factors. Because if we understand the biology, 
I'm not advocate I'm not personally advocating that we say to everybody over the age of 35 increased risk of stillbirth you know we should be offering you delivery at 35 weeks over the age of 40 I think it's more arguable what we need to be doing is saying right if you are at increased risk why are some of you at increased risk and some of you aren't and then we can target what we're doing to women who are at highest risk rather than just having this kind of blanket um, policy hopefully an interesting study that's going to come out this year this year is um, something called the Midlands and North of England stillbirth study. I don't know if any of you have been in units where um, have been recruiting to this. This recruited nearly 300 mums that had a stillbirth um, and actually, in, in the end, recruited nearly 800 controls. And we finished this in March. And this um, is to identify modifiable risk factors. So, you know, the, the sleep position study that came out of Auckland? That was much smaller than this. That had 110 cases of stillbirth and 220 controls. This is going to give us much better information about sleep position, baby's movements, mum's diet. So this will be coming out, hopefully, at the International Stillbirth Meeting in Cork in September. There's a little plug for you. If, you want to come, if this conference has wet your appetite a bit and you also like Southern Ireland, um, I would encourage you on the 20, I can't remember it now, I think it's the 21st and 22nd of September um, in Cork, there's the International Stillbirth Meeting, um, so it's a, a real focus there. And so one of the things that's happened, so the STARS case control, so it's another case control study, has confirmed that there's a significant association between a reduction in baby's movement, so a mum, mums who had a stillbirth were 13 times more likely to have reduced fetal movements uh, than mums that had a live baby. But one of the other things that this has begun to develop as an idea is a period of excessive fetal movements. And you often, I mean, those of you who you know, work with parents who've had a stillbirth, this is something that gets reported, but it's something that's been kind of completely overlooked in the literature. And, and they're actually six times more likely to report that period of increased movements. So... There's, you know, new ideas are coming out from these studies. Um, there's also work going on to look at placental function tests, and I think if we have this meeting in five or ten years, we're going to be much more used to doing blood tests to tell us how well a placenta is working. So there was this study that was written up last year of 411 mums had a baby that was small. And what it found was that a placental growth factor result actually correctly predicted babies that were going to die 87.5% um, of the time. Now, it wasn't specific. It got it wrong. There were some false positives. But actually, the odds if you had a low PLGF were nearly 1 in 20 compared to 1 in 200 if you had a normal PLGF. So if I said to you, you've got a small baby, I think you should be induced, and you say, well, I'm not very interested in that. That's fine. If you say, oh, I'm going to do a blood test, and then actually your blood test shows that your risk of your baby dying is now 1 in 20 compared to 1 in 200, you might be more inclined to say, OK, you know, your number needed to treat is then one, you know, is, is, is much, much better. And this is true, that of, 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 this, this is a pooled analysis of different placental blood tests and that you can see that actually the sensitivity is pretty good. And so I think if we have a meeting like this, if Chris decides to put himself through it again, um, or, or, and those of you who've organised it, put yourself through it again, that in five years' time, some of this might be in practice. Um, the infant study was a multi-centre randomised control trial of an intelligent system to help make decision-making in labour. It was a huge study. It was the biggest randomised control trial of its kind. 46,000 women were... Um, were, were were randomised, and actually they, these were published last year, and it showed actually that the intelligence system was no better than the buddy system, uh, which I think was really interesting. We were not expecting this. So that does underpin the need to do really big studies to see if there's a difference. Um, and lastly, there's um, a firm which is, gonna, which is now finished, um, and this was a stepped wedge cluster trial. Now, a stepped wedge cluster trial is a bit like a before and after study, but it's where you introduce a change in maternity units sequentially. 
and you compare all of their before and afters. So it's a little bit more robust than just saying, you know, before 2015 we did this, after 2016 we did that. Let's see if we see a reduction in stillbirth. And if we've got data in this study for over 300,000 births um, and to see whether educating mums about, still, about babies' movements and also doing a scan and a CTG when they come in with reduced movements reduces perinatal mortality. <coughs> and lastly, the other sort of research that you can do is, is qualitative. And it's, that's really, really important. I've blasted you with a heck of a lot of numbers in the last 25 minutes, um, and I apologise for that. And the thing is, you're not going to probably, you're going to go away from here and remember almost none of the numbers. And I don't, won't take that personally, it's just that as human beings, we're not very good at remembering numbers, but we are very good at remembering stories. And you will remember the stories that you've heard today way more than the numbers. But actually, to capture what's happening in practice is really important. Um, and, and we have a, a clinic um, at St Mary's called the Rainbow Clinic, which is specifically for mums who've had a baby that's died before. And we wanted to know what happens to everybody, because it's actually a really important risk factor for stillbirth. Women who've had one stillbirth or neonatal death are five times more likely to have another stillbirth or neonatal death than someone that hasn't. That is a population that we can do something about so easily. And that, is, that risk factor is bigger than diabetes, it's bigger than hypertension, and they have special, we have specialist clinics to look after those women because of their risk. But we completely overlook this group. And so we wanted to know what happened. We, so we asked 138 maternity units, and we asked women about the care that they got. And actually very few um, units, I'm aware that obviously Bradford is somewhere that does have a specific clinic, but very, very few places do. Um, and there were some brilliant places, um, so there was women do engage early with maternity care and place high values on their professionals uh, for emotional support, but actually a significant minority reported negative experiences of care and perceived to be, you know, fussing about nothing. Um, and um, another common thing was actually breakdown in communication. People saying things like, is this your first baby? It's pretty insensitive if your first baby died. Um, happens quite a lot. And there were four common themes that came out of this, that sensitive communication and conduct of staff was really important, the appropriate organisation and delivery of services, increased monitoring and surveillance, and also a perception of specialist care was really important. So... That's a real whistle-stop tour of some of the research that's happening in the UK. There is an awful lot more happening now than was happening 10 years ago. And I think it's really important for all of you in this room is that you don't regard research as something that is done by somebody else. Because it's a real classic example that one of the reasons that stillbirth, has moved for stillbirth research has moved forward is because there's been specific efforts to make sure that it does. If this is something that you care about, this is something that you can change and something you can develop. And that doesn't matter if it's a qualitative study that looks at the, experience, the bereavement experience, the experiences of 10 bereaved dads, because that will change. That provides evidence for us to develop care for bereaved dads. So it doesn't have to be, you think, well, I can't do a step wage cluster trial of 300,000 women. No, you can't. But, do you know, that started because when I was an SHO, I did a not very good study of 100 consecutive women who came with reduced movements. And it snowballs. So I would say to all of you that we've all got a role in this rather than just me just Louise, just the specialist midwives and the specialist researchers. So I'm not overlooking the fact that there's the, the global burden of stillbirth is in low and middle income countries, but there is a massive amount of preventable mortality within high income countries and there's an opportunity for us to prevent tens of thousands of deaths per year. And that occurs across healthcare in public health and we need adequately powered studies. So hopefully, going back to my initial diagram of how things might happen, is actually by doing perinatal audit and those confidential inquiries, we've looked at growth restriction and reduced movements. We've found that there's a problem. We've tried to develop interventions by doing things like placental blood tests, um, 
That then goes into an evidence base, we try and implement it, and then we need to see if it reduces stillbirth. Um, lastly, um, I'm just going to end on a completely shameless plug, um, is that on the 20th of March this year, um, we are um, running a, a, a study day. It is free. Um, all you've got to do is get to Manchester, which I realise is the other side of the Pennines. Um, but we don't bite hard. Um, and it's about trying to um, share uh, the experiences we've had uh, running a specialist clinic for mums who um, have had a previous um, stillbirth or neonatal death. Um, if you are interested in coming, um, I encourage you to email um, Louise, um, or you could speak to her, she's over there. Wave, Louise. Um, and um, we'd, we'd love to see you there. So on that note, I'm going to be quiet. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me.